So we want to start talking about our renal patients and our chronic renal failure and all of our dialysis costs. Because as we, this is becoming more and more of a regular thing, seems like we hear constantly, we're headed to the dialysis center once again, and with being more dialysis centers now in the city of Lubbock, uh, this is becoming a big portion of kind of what we're doing. And so we want to discuss a few things of, of talk about the, the end stage kidney process, the dialysis process, the different types of shunts and, and graphs and pick lines that are available. <laughs> So some of the objectives we want to talk about tonight is we want to learn about uh, learn about renal function and end stage or chronic kidney disease. We want to understand the prevalence and the risk factors to these, to these things, who's getting it and who's not getting it. Uh, we want to examine the difference between the vascular accesses like we talked about and the best to care for these things. And then we want to talk about a couple of cases that we've had at the Dallas Center recently. So what exactly do the kidneys do? Well, it filters blood. We all know that. Uh, it, it, it actually filters a lot of blood. At any given time, there's about 25% of the blood volume in the body that's going through the kidneys at that point. Uh, they also keep about, they also filter about 30 to 38 gallons of blood and they redirect all different sorts of things through different parts of the body. They retain some, of, retain some of it and they make it a waste product on other portions. So we're gonna visit more about that as, as we get on in. So obviously the kidneys make urine. Uh, that's uh, Captain Obvious here, and so that's, that's kind of its main portion there. And it's usually most improper time or inappropriate time when we don't want it to. It's when it's making its call that we're ready. On average, the kidney makes about a fourth to half a gallon of urine every day in every 24 hour period, made up mainly of waste product and extra fluid that your body doesn't need on board. A uh, kidney plays a huge role with regulating blood pressure, not only with the baroreceptors that set on the uh, carotid sinus, but also on top of the uh, aorta. Uh, there is your baroreceptors and all those things work together and they start to uh, admit different uh, renin and angiotensin in order to control our blood pressure of what's going on. And most of this is set up and controlled by the kidneys at that point uh, through renin and angiotensin and we're going to kind of break that down. So the basics of renin and angiotensin, remember that uh, we do carry drugs on the truck that affect this. We're gonna talk about those, but the kidneys uh, will sense that, hey, I've got low blood pressure. Something's going on, whether I may be septic or I may uh, you know, be bleeding out, I may just be uh, have hypotension for some reason. And the kidneys say, whoa, 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 I'm not getting enough here because it's very important I do my job. So it's gonna to start to kick out uh, the pro-renin that's already running through the body, and it's gonna convert it into renin at that point. Uh, once that renin comes through, it's going to start to affect the angiotensin, uh, which is normally released by the liver. And it's already in the bloodstream, but this renin is going to react with the uh, angiotensin to make angio I'm sorry, to do the angiotensin 1. Once that angiotensin 1 gets there, it's going to convert itself over to angiotensin 2, which is where uh, angiotensin converting enzymes come into place, or the ACE. Now, we give an allopril on the ambulance to block our CHF patients from closing down after we've blown them open with nitro. So that's what it does is it puts that block on there and it says, uh-uh, you're not gonna, it's not gonna happen right here with our ACE, so I'm not gonna allow those vessels to squeeze. So no matter how much renin and angiotensin 1, angiotensin 2 kicks in, it's gonna block that at that point. So angiotensin 2 becomes into play and becomes a very potent base constrictor. So the kidneys say, hey, I've got to have more, or the brain says, I've got to have more. I've got to have more flow. So it starts to convert everything to squeeze everything tight to start pushing blood flow where I need it. No different than with uh, epinephrine during a code. I'm trying to squeeze it and get it where I need it to be. So a quick review, my pro-renin turns to renin. My renin and the angiotensin come in to make angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 with ACE comes in or the uh, angiotensin uh, converting enzyme. It says makes angiotensin 2 and that's how I get the squeeze going. So the drugs that people are on, usually at home for blood pressure medicines, kind of the entry level I would say of blood pressure medicines. A lot of times you have the ACE inhibitors on board which is going to block that ACE from turning into angiotensin 2. Or you have your ARB, which is going to block the angiotensin 2 receptor itself. And so that's how those drugs start to come into play of, of what we're doing. So you get a renal patient with high blood pressure that's on lisinopril, which is an angiotensin 1. You can see where this is going. So 
talk about what our kitties actually do, well, they start to filter and they start to regulate how much sodium, water, and a whole host of other things that are in the body, and then we start to excrete what we don't need. So the things that it mainly handles is water, sodium, chloride, potassium, calcium, magnesium, phosphate, amino acids, urea, <coughs> bicarbonate, um, and then it starts to really start to regulate with the pH and the glucose. And so you can see these things, and so we don't really think about it at the end of the day, when we talk about end-stage renal disease, these patients are affected on so many different levels uh, on their, just their daily living and they miss one appointment and you can kind of see how this starts to magnify itself and cause problems with all these different areas. So not only are they just uh, are the kidneys filters but they're also release hormones. Uh, they secrete your pointed. Anyway is what this does you know we see our, our renal patients a lot of times they're anemic and the reason they're anemic is is because this hormone that is released regulates the red blood cells that's drive, driven by the red blood cell or by the uh, bone marrow. It also secretes renin. We talked about that. And then it uh, activates form of vitamin D and prostaglandins, which become very important later on. And so you can see that not only are they filtering systems, but it's also a producer of certain things. And also remember our adrenal glands that's on top of the kidney, which can be affected uh, eventually. So. <coughs> We talk about the major vessels, so what the anatomy and physiology behind this, what feeds our kidneys? What causes these problems that we have sometimes? We've got to remember that our artery, our uh, aorta comes off and we have our renal arteries come down. And remember at any given time, 25% of the oxygenated blood, 25% of the oxygenated blood goes to the kidneys and it begins to get filtered. Once it gets filtered and it retains what we need and, and kicks out what we don't need, the inferior vena cava receives it back and it sends it back to the heart. So that blood doesn't have to go far. The renal arteries get, get the blood very quickly. And once again, 25%, that's a large part of our blood volume just going for filterization each pump. So how do the filters work? Well, as the kidneys get in, we have uh, nephrons. Nephrons. And they begin, we have about a million of those uh, in each kidney and so it begins to filter this system out. Uh, the purpose of this is to filter the kidney so we're going to look at really closely well, how it works. As it comes down, another big word that you threw in there, glomerulus. I had to really work on this one. The glomerulus allows water uh, and small size particles to come through. Now this is actually into the kidney, the arterials and the capillaries coming in comes in uh, and gets filtered, and then what gets kicked out goes into Bowman's capsule. Once Bowman's capsule catches it, that's where it turns into urine. That's where our waste product comes into play. Uh, and then uh, the rest of it gets filtered, the sodium, the potassium, the water that it, the body does require, gets filtered back into the system uh, and back into the vena cava to kick out. So this is a picture of a very, very sick kidney, um, about the size of a football, so very uh, long-term uh, renal disease at this point. This is a polycystic uh, kidney disease, and this is an inherited condition. Um, with about a million of these filtering systems coming into play, uh, they taught you can tolerate one kidney being lost without too much effect. It takes up to about 75 to 90 percent of the kidney being damaged before you start to see signs and symptoms. Can you do that with a heart? No. Can you do that with a brain? No. So you've got a very unique organ here that's able to tolerate a long time being damaged or not working properly before we start to really see signs and symptoms of what's going on. So what causes acute renal disease? Well, it all depends on, this can happen over days, over hours, uh, depending on um, uh, what is the pathology behind it. So we have the uh, pre-renal failure. This is where we have hypoperfusion, so sepsis, maybe a trauma situation where the patient's hypovolemic for a long period of time. They just don't have the blood flow going into it. Then we have uh, intrarenal, this is where it affects the actual filtration system. The filtration system on the inside stops working and it's not able to filter any longer. And then you have your post renal, which is an obstructive or drainage problem, such as kidney stones and large prostate or, or tumors that are in place. 
And so that can be a cause of our renal failure at the same time we can start to shut down our kidneys at that point. So what causes uh, renal impairment? Um, chronic renal disease, once again, uh, this is our majority of our dialysis patients. Uh, this can be both, both uh, life-threatening and permanent at this point. So once they, you know, they've had a, uh, they've had a polycystic kidney they found, the kidneys are now shut down, and that's where we're already into the stage four and five before it's caught. Uh, and so they're gonna have to start going on dialysis fairly quickly. <coughs> Um, some of this can be caused by just years of not controlling your blood pressure or your diabetes. And so that's where those two factors come into play from the human side of it uh, that can lead up to chronic renal failure. Uh, also another thing is genetic disease and sickle cell anemia and then the polycystic uh, kidney. So that can start to increase uh, those chances of uh, kidney and renal failure. So who, what, when, where, and why? Well, about 20 million Americans are diagnosed with uh, chronic kidney disease at some stage or the other. Now, like we talked about, 75 to 90% of it before it can cause some symptoms. So a lot of these patients are in a longer stage or a more deadly life-threatening stage of it before it's picked up a lot of times. High blood pressure and diabetes, once again, the leading, excuse me, the leading cause of chronic uh, kidney disease so for the diabetics, one out of every three diabetic is gonna get kidney failure, and one out of every five adults with high blood pressure is gonna get kidney failure. So that kind of puts it into perspective of, of where we're headed with this. So end-stage renal disease, once again, uh, these, these folks, and it we start talking about male, female, and races. So the African-American is gonna be about three times higher chance to get kidney failure long-term, to get chronic renal failure uh, versus any, anybody else in the United States over Caucasians in, 20, in uh, 2009. The American Indian population uh, actually experienced some leveling off in the 2000s, and they think some of that is starting to get a better control or better uh, preventive medicine of their hypertension and diabetes uh, at that point, so it's kind of leveled off. But uh, once again, uh, uh, African-Americans are gonna be your highest uh, probability of renal uh, failure. So just how bad is your patient's renal disease? Well, we start kind of weighing it. And they, they start to look at a couple of different things. First of all, they take a blood sample. And you're thinking, well, they take a blood sample to see how I'm peeing. That doesn't make quite sense. But as what starts to happen is the, uh, the GRF comes into play. And it's what it is, is it's a refined number to the creatinine. And so we've all heard BUN, creatinine over years, and we know that's kidney problems. But to break it down is what starts to happen is, uh, it really starts to look at the creatinine and starts to break down by, by muscle. And so what's being left in the body is not being filtered out. That's what we're seeing is, is how that's being filtered. Uh, one of the other things is the BUN, and then we have protein in the urine, the diet, medications, and other uh, diagnosis can be considered as well of what's causing this end-stage renal. So we take a blood sample and we take a CMP uh, and a lot of times when we talk about these CMPs because guys, more and more we're going to clinics and they're handing you lab. And I hope you're looking at those and everybody stresses over, well, I don't know what the numbers are. Well, on the other, the right hand side, typically it's gonna say high or low or normal. It's gonna give you the range. So at least you can pick out what's abnormal at that point. Uh, creatinine is normally broke down, uh, is a broke down product from muscle metabolism. Um, in the blood plasma and it gets filtered in the kidneys. Uh, what does it need to, what do the body doesn't need, it's gonna put into the urine and, and kick it out. If there's a, a, some type of concentrated BUN, so we get a higher number, uh, then we're gonna know that we're into a chronic renal failure at that point. Now, some of our older patients, men, women, difference, difference in races, difference in muscle masses. So a frail 90 year old female is not gonna have is going to have a smaller concentration of creatinine than a young male that's working in a, an oil field. He's, he's going to have a higher percentage of creatinine in the body. Um, and so this, some, a lot of this depends on age, a lot of this depends on your body build, your muscle mass, and how well your kidneys are, are once again functioning. The fortunate thing is the GFR, do y'all look at GFRs quite a bit? G? Mainly B and creatinine. Just B and creatinine? So does this automatically filter for y'all though? It gives you a GFR. GFR. Yeah. So it's a, more, a little bit more refined and specific, 
But guys, this is why we're, we need blood draw a lot of times when we're on our stroke patients. Because as soon as they get it, they're going to do a BUN and creatinine, and they're going to tell in a, a GFR real quick, they're going to see what is the kidney function. Can the, can the kidneys tolerate the contrast dye? And so that's one of the standards for a quick CT and a CTA, because the CTA takes a little bit more uh, dye than, than just a CT does. Well, so, so a standard CT is no dye. There's nope. CT without, CT with, CTA, CT angiogram takes the most amount of dye. Right. And you're right, there's thresholds that it varies depending on kind of your radiology and how bad do you need the contrasted scan. You know, sometimes maybe the kidneys are a little weak, but if you're worried they may have a, you know, a dissected aorta, we really need to know if they have a dissected aorta and there's really no other way to tell. So you just take your chance. You might ding the kidneys, but it's to find out if they have a bad aorta. And also something else, don't call it a bun. They'll be, people will make fun of you. Yeah. That's all. Be you in. You always get a medical student saying that their bun is blah, blah, blah. You're gonna get made fun of. Don't say bun. Don't say eyes or perla. So we start talking about the, uh, the GFR and what's normal. So it's usually between the higher numbers better. Uh, 90 or better means my kidneys are functioning really well. Uh, so stage one disease would mean uh, that it's about 90 or greater normal kidney function and you're just gonna observe them. Once we get to stage two, it starts to drop to 60 to 89. And guys, you're gonna see these numbers on your lab values. So now it'll kind of start making more sense of why you're looking at that. Uh, this is mild, uh, mild reduction of kidney function. You're gonna observe it and you're gonna to start to control your blood pressure and diabetes. This is where that preventive medicine, this is where the Native American population came into play, starting to monitor their people a little bit better and control these uh, controllable uh, disease processes. Between 30 and 59, this is where we move into stage three. This is moderately reduced uh, kidney function, observation, blood pressure, diet, and risk factor control. So weight control, different smoking, those type of things. Uh, stage four moves into 15 to 29. This is more severe. Uh, this is starting to plan for the end stage renal and then uh, less than 15, stage five. This is full blown kidney. This is what we're gonna talk about, kidney transplant or dialysis. Now, everybody thinks about we have so many dialysis centers, why don't people just get kidney transplants? Not all of them are candidates. Uh, there's very few kidneys donated uh, each year, and I can't remember the exact numbers, but it's, it wasn't, I mean, you would think as many people are dying, especially younger, you could use it, but it has to meet all the risk factors. And so there's just not a lot of kidneys available. It's like hearts. You know, there's just not a lot of them available to get people to transplant. So then we start talking about uremia. Uh, at stage four and stage five, uh, the kidneys uh, cannot function. They cannot clear the fluids. They cannot clear the toxins out. And so this is where uh, we, we move into that full-blown dialysis stage. Um, so anytime they miss, you're gonna have, the patient's gonna start to build <coughs> uremia. And so we don't think about that a lot, but it's what happens is, is the ammonia uh, is produced by proteins that are broke down from the energy source uh, and from other circumstances. The liver converts it from ammonia to urea. And then urea is excreted through uh, the urine. So it doesn't take a lot. You know, you have those, those patients, especially those renal patients that haven't been, they've been two, shit, two times without going, three times without going, and they're starting to get that ultra mental status. It's because their body's not converting that ammonia over to urea to get it out. They can't get it out because the kidneys aren't working. And so that's where we have, start to have that ultra mental status. So some of the typical things we'll see with uremia is, and y'all are gonna read these thinking, well, this is my kidney failure patient. And it sure is when they've been missing. But it's that progressive weakness and fatigue. We talk about uh, nausea, uh, muscle atrophy, tremors, uh, alto mental function, shallow respirations, metabolic acidosis, and then you have the uremic frost. How many times have you been to a dialysis center and you see patients that have that kind of a white flaky frost on them? You see it all the time and you think, man, they're really like a dry skin, they got real bad dry skin. That's not, that's a uremic frost. And that's from where they've missed and they're not able to, uh, they're trying to excrete it through their uh, sweat glands at that point. So how do we fix it? We, this is where we start moving to our hemodialysis. Now we got a couple different dialysis, type of dialysis that we're seeing. Uh, the second one, not so much is, as the more prominent one. But Dr. Koff uh, was a, a Dutch uh, physician back in 1943, and there wasn't a lot of supplies. So he made his first dialysis machine with uh, some sausage skins, 
orange juice cans, a washing machine, and other common items that he could just kind of get his hands on that would filter out the toxins. Sounds what was like, it? What was sounds it? Like Donnie built it. What was it like though? Then? <laughs> Ouch. Shut up. <laughs> I'm glad you said on the front. Uh, so as you can see, these machines are far more advanced today. Uh, as you can see that this starts to lead the blood through whatever device that they may have to filter from. It's going to go through, first of all, you get an uh, arterial pressures. It's going to come out to the blood pump. It's going to send it through the filtration system um, and then back through the clot and the bubble trap to make sure we don't put anything back in. It could be deadly and then right back into the body. So that's the basis of, of how the hemodialysis, uh, the mechanism of that machine works. And remember, it's all osmosis, just membrane and stuff moves across. That's why you have uh, the dialysate and, you know, it's got different levels of ion. The blood goes through it and just a, it's a semi-permeable membrane and stuff moves. That's osmosis. That's about all it is. I tried to study it like that once, but it didn't work. <laughs> So we start talking about the newly diagnosed uh, end-stage renal patients. They may have the subclavian or they may have the, uh, the uh, double lumen catheter that comes out. This actually both sits in the vein, so it's in the subclavian. Sits so just right above the, the uh, right atrium at that point. But they've separated the, by about three centimeters apart, the, the, uh, what that they call the venous vein and the arterial graft. And so they, they'll suck, they'll try to keep from cross uh, cross contaminate from dumping it back in and sucking it right back out. So this is the initial spot and you're going to understand why they do this, but this is something they can drop fairly quickly. This is uh, typically something they do in just day surgery, correct? Right. I mean, even before this, you can essentially put this same catheter in the groin, like right. a, a temporary or, and that, that thing's a hose. It's probably like a number two pencil. It's seven French rip. Yeah, it's big. It's like putting a Foley catheter into a vein. Yeah. So they get it threaded in and gives them immediate access to where they can start dialysizing the patient. Remember we talked about hours to days this kidney failure comes into play. So when that does kick in, we've got to be very aggressive with filtering that uh, quickly once the kidney stops working or it becomes a life threat. So this gives us means to do that. Some of the problems with this is, is because um, infection is the biggest cause. And as you can see, you get nice, I bet that's pretty warm. It's big infected. Um, and it does have a greater risk than our grafts and our fistulas in the arms. Uh, it does have a greater chance of, by the literature of thrombosis. And uh, once again, you can get central vein stenosis from that. So this isn't a good long-term catheter, but it is a good short-term to get in there to where we can start the dialysis process and start to make things better. So remember in our protocols, this is the only life threat that we can actually use to access if there is a if we're in a peri-arrest we're in a rest state and we have this catheter we can actually access it in the field we wanted to, to go over that uh, remember that we always want to choose the blues the blue lumen to do that blue to the body and red says stop uh, we want to clamp the pigtail before we want to make sure that we don't have any air embolus in there we want to uh, give it a good scrub, and I understand, you know, in the field, this is probably not the best <clears throat> proper process, but we need to make sure that we really, really clean these catheters very good. Uh, you want to make sure that you scrub the access port thoroughly with uh, uh, an alcohol prep. Uh, remember that the catheters are a great risk of infection, which can cause death to our patients, so we need to be very diligent about cleaning this thing good. Attach a 10 cc syringe. We need to draw at least 10 cc's off and discard that. A lot of times these are heparinized, so we want to make sure that we're drawing all that heparin off. Um, we want to ver and then that's going to also verify the patency of it. We want to make sure we don't have a big booger or a big clot at the end of it. You want to make sure that it's flowing well, and so if it's going to return, then you can push through and make sure it's going to flush well. Once again, then we're going to take a 10 cc flush. We're going to discard that blood uh, in the sharps container. Put a, a 10 mils of NS in, make sure it flushes easy, make sure that it's flowing nice uh, before we uh, end up using it. And then we're going to prime our line once again, keep it very clean, use the Kuros uh, if we have those available, and make sure that we're, we're keeping those all the caps on place because we want to keep that infection down on our patients. And I'll mention because you know, some ways you can say, well, why can't we just use that for if they need a, I don't know, a shot of morphine, they just hurt, they have a catheter hanging out. I think you pointed out pretty well 
you know, this is a high chance of getting an infection. And we don't do that great in the field, given it clean. And even in the ER, if somebody has one of these, we're gonna try to get another side if they need routine medication, <coughs> because it is such a high risk infection. It's a high risk of getting clotted. And then it's a big ordeal to the patient if any of that happens. So that's why we, but obviously in a life or death type situation, yeah, use that sucker. That's better than spending the time to get an IV or an IO or something. Now our next couple of talks, when we start talking about the AV grafts and the fistulas, what are the difference between them? Uh, because sometimes they're even hard to see in the field of which ones they are without asking your patient. But how we take care of them, and we're not, absolutely not going to be able to use these in the field. We're going to talk about why. So the fistula is where they take the artery and they fuse it with the vein. And this takes a, a several weeks of high pressure and that vein will actually get larger. It'll get stronger and it'll get larger and it'll be able to use on both sides. So they'll have the, the arterial side and the venous side uh, for that. This is more of a permanent fix. A lot of times it may take a couple of months to get this fully up and going once they have the surgery to uh, make sure that, that the fistula is in good shape. Uh, and, and it's going to be, uh, it's going to take some time to get this mature. So you can see if I have a dialysis patient, they're going to have this in place and we're going to use that double lumen for as long as they can while this is healing up and getting ready to go for a more permanent uh, use. The graft then comes in, this is where they take a piece of artificial, uh, of artificial synthetic tubing and they go in and they connect the artery to the graft by a loop method and then tie them together. So both of these you're going to be able to feel pulsating probably on both sides more than anything, but definitely on that arterial side you're going to feel a nice pulsation uh, in that graft because that graft's going to be quite a bit larger. Now remember that we've had to wait a little bit of time for the fistula to come in so that vein gets a lot bigger. Uh, but the graft typically doesn't take quite as long for it to heal uh, around these two sites right here is the main spot and then they can start using it uh, a lot faster. I would venture to say that we probably see more grafts than fistulas. Everybody agree with that? Any comments? I, I would venture to say we see a lot more grafts than <coughs> fistulas anymore. Uh, it seems like they, they, they're quite a bit quicker. Yeah, so, don't know. do what? But if you ask a lot of them, they don't know what they have. That's, that's probably yeah. a true statement. And, and that, it doesn't affect us, that's a nice thing. We're not gonna mess with either one of them, but uh, it is kind of important at the hospital. <clears throat> so we talk about our AV, AV fistulas. Uh, this is going to be the, the greatest longevity. I usually use it for many years because it's all natural in there. Less chance of infection, but it does have a greater risk of bleeding after dialysis and it's very visible in the arm. So that's one of the disadvantages. Now, if I had to have that, you know, bulky thing sticking up so I could live, then fine, so be it. Let's do it. Um, but, uh, you know, some people that, that might bother them. Uh, the graft, uh, on the AV graft side, it takes less time for it to mature. It's able to be used a lot earlier, usually less prominent in the arm, but some of the side effects to it, it does have a little bit higher risk of infection, and uh, it, it has, does have an increased risk of clotting because it is an artificial graft in there. It's an artificial tubing. So they both have their, their do's and their don'ts and their disadvantages and advantages. But I would venture to say I agree with you. A lot of them may not even know what they have. They just know they have a shunt. Uh, and at the end of the day, that's typically what uh, they're going to call uh, their shunt. So why don't we access these in the field? Well, first of all, it, it, you need to, you really need to know exactly what you're, what you're working with, first of all. Uh, but because typically anymore, they just say I have an AV shunt or I have a, a dialysis shunt. And so um, access should be done in a very aseptic technique, and this is why we don't do it in the field, but you can see there's different types of needles that are required. These are buttonholes, and they, so it's a constant side every time they stick the same spot. Versus other people, you may look at their arm, and it may be look like a rope ladder. So they may rotate the spots on it each time they go basis, so there may be multiple stick where you see scabs and, and uh, scars on, on multiple spots. And so that's kind of how this is, how this works. Uh, now, is it appropriate for if they're already on dialysis and they're in bad shape, uh, they're in a peri-arrest and they already have the graft open and we have a line running, could we use that? I would ask the dialysis person, because obviously if they have the, if the port is, or it is access, so it's a little special needle that goes into there, I would ask the dialysis facility, hey, are you good with me trying that? 
And the other day we went over for an arrest and they were like, hey, we've already got a line for you. Yeah. It's already running. And so they were very good with that. And typically, you know, in a bad situation, <coughs> if it's already accessed by them, it's done how they know to do it. Yeah. You know, that would be a judgment call on how sick that patient is. If that patient's, you know, in a, an arrest or peri-arrest or about to code, you know, that's something that you kind of got to wait. Because that's the question we've been getting a little bit lately. Hey, can we just, we've already got it accessed, we're good to go. Uh, and so. And but, even if it's, you know, let's say the patient just has chest pain, a lot of times you'll just transport them with those in, right? Because to take them out, you know, you got to hold pressure and et cetera, et cetera, and the patient needs to go on. And even in the ER, if we have somebody come in and they have that, and we're going to discharge the patient, or we call a dialysis nurse because they've got a technique how they take that out. We don't know, and the ER nurses don't know how to either. So something you kind of got to weigh. Is there a problem if you access above it, we were always, and we're going to talk about that. Yes, it is a problem because, and the problem with it is, is you've got to, you've got to tourniquet it to get tourniqueted. Is that? Yeah, right? I think you're worried about an increase in the yeah. chance of clot. So you're increasing. Probably, we're going to talk more about that here in just a second of, of how, it, why we don't do that. And so we'll visit about that. So some important information about the grafts and fistula is uh, do not obtain a blood pressure or attempt any IV sites on that arm where the functional shunt shun is now. How many times you got there and they say, well, this shunt's bad, this shunt's bad, but this one's good today. Okay, and so you kind of got to weigh it. Where am I going to take a blood pressure? Everybody goes up my legs. It may be an all uh, NIVP blood pressures. If it's an old graft in there, what are your thoughts? Well, it doesn't matter anymore. Okay, doesn't it's matter a, anymore. So you can tourniquet, you can blood pressure and everything on that arm, but you've got to make sure that that's their bad grafts. And we've seen some, you know, they'll have thighs, I mean, they'll have them two or three, four, five, six different spots. Um, if the patient's unresponsive, keep the blood pressure um, cuff off that access point. So, you know, guys, a lot of times, sometimes on codes, you may not know that it's a dialysis patient right off the get-go if you're not at the dialysis center. And there's, you know, they're over at a friend's house and, and the friend doesn't know a lot about them. So, you know, you always be checking uh, those things. As, you know, typically the, you see the, uretic, the uh, uremic frost, you may see you know, they just, they have that jaundice, they may just not look good, they look like that, we don't have a high suspicion there. Um, why do we not want to do this? It's because anytime we add something to cut off blood flow here, I sure do run a risk of causing a clot downstream. And especially if that's a graft, I want to stay away from clots in that area. If I clot that thing off, they've got to go in and rebuild it and start over. They're going to have to get another double lumen, and then they're going to have to go in and try to find another spot to start this process. Well, no, they can go in sometimes and declot, but not all the time. But even just to go in and declot, I mean, it's a major thing. It's going into the groin, going into the vessel, trying to infuse heparin into it, and it's not always successful. Is there a reason why they don't take them out? Because we saw one the other day. He had literally four graphs, and only one of them was good. Uh, Is there no. a reason why they don't take them out? <clears throat> okay. I didn't know the answer to it either. It's probably there's just no, I mean, to just go through the surgery, you know, because that thing's going to, you imagine the scarring to the and skin to and everything. Those arteries I off. just, I think that's a, probably going to be a lot of it. Just, okay. You'd have to cut skin and everything out. Okay. Oh, yeah. So, good, good, uh, good thought process. So, um, so we, once again, do not want to use uh, any tourniquets on this. So, how many times we call a dialysis center and they say we can't get it to stop bleeding? Or they're home and the dialysis center starts to bleed? We do not want to tourniquet those because we will cause, we can increase the chance of causing it to clot. One of the things I need to do though, is I need to put direct pressure with gauze for at least 10 minutes, but do not use the tourniquet once again. Why this, uh, I don't want to bear down. I don't want to completely clamp it off. I just need to hold pressure on it. I just need to stop the blood flow uh, as best I can. A cap tourniquet is not the way to do these things. You know, you'll see them, we went to the blood pressure, the uh, center the other day, and they had actually had a blood pressure cuff on it right over the, sh the graft pushing pressure on it. And the, I thought the doctor was going to have a coronary when he got there. Uh, but guys, it just takes a little bit of pressure with some gauze on there. Now, mm -hmm. let's add this to it though. If I do have an amputation, a traumatic amputation, then yes, that would be an appropriate time. So we can put the cat tourniquet on if we have a traumatic. That's, that's Captain Obvious there, okay? So we got to kind of weigh that. That I would venture to say if there's an amputation there, that fistula or that graft is no longer good. I would <coughs> just guess it. But I would probably say, so we've got to do save life threat at that point. 
Um, so these patients, uh, these needle, needle access points, a lot of times, once again, they're just going to be a very small hole. Now, remember, they're under pressure. Uh, they're they're going to be under pressure, direct pressure from the artery side, and so they're going to squirt. They're going to uh, they're going to put out some blood, and you're going to think it's a lot bigger cut than it actually is. Most of the time, these are just needle accesses. Now, there has been times where grafts or fistulas have um, shred, ruptured, yeah. ruptured inside there. We may have a different problem at that point. You got to kind of weigh that, but that should be control cr controllable by just simple pressure for about 10 minutes. Apply firm pressure once again. We want to prevent clots. We don't want to completely occlude it. Uh, be patient. This may take some time, up to 10 minutes. Remember, a lot of these patients, when this blood is coming back in, it's heparinized at some point. And so it's a little bit thin coming in. Your clotting factors are not in place. Um, do not use serrated hemostats or anything else to clamp it. <laughs> I've, I've not seen that, but uh, I've heard stories over the years of people going in and clamping them. So could be a could be a problem comment okay. and you've seen they have kind of those plastic i'm sure they have a name at the dialysis centers that they kind of clamp on the whole arm but i don't know what they call that, those. But they know what they're doing yeah <clears throat> so then we can move into peritoneal dialysis uh, peritoneal dialysis is, is an option that we do have some patients we see on that uh, they this gives them the option of doing this all at home uh, typically it's done while they're sleeping at night takes about two and a half to four hours um, <clears throat> to do it. Uh, they will have a permanent catheter that's in place uh, and then they'll feel from the, uh, the feel the fluid from the top and it'll gravity flow in, clamp this off, they'll open it up and then once again it's all permeable like you said permeable <coughs> membranes and so it absorbs all those toxins and all the waste out of the blood uh, that's in the gut and it's going to help pull it back into this and then that's going to be your peritoneal dialysis. This is something that's not just real popular here. I don't know if it is in other places, but we don't see a lot of patients with this. But occasionally you'll come across one that says, I'm on peritoneal dialysis and that's going to tell you, hey, they're probably, re they're probably an end stage uh, renal failure at that point. <clears throat> so here's just a little diagram and this is kind of what that tube looks like that comes out. Uh, so what is any tube sticking out? It's kind of like an LVAD or anything else. It has a high chance of infection. Okay, so you can kind of see where these um, these are. Some of the advantages of this though is it's a little more comfortable. They can be at home when they do this on their own time. Uh, it's a daily exchange so it keeps the balance of the electrolytes a little bit better than waiting every other day to go to dialysis. Uh, and there's no disfiguring uh, of the arm uh, for the dialysis shunts. So somebody that's in maybe a stage four, I would say, into some stage fives if they can tolerate it, this may be an option for them. It also becomes a big compliance thing because you're doing that like, I don't know exactly how many, I, mean, I think you've got it four times a day. I mean, yeah. this is all day long you're doing this. You've got to have bags and bags and bags of this dialysate and and then you've got the waste products you got to do something with so it's a big pain i mean in theory it sounds great because oh i can stay at home but most people don't want to sit at home the 18 hours a day that you have to do this and you really can't go to walmart with it so people end up well i'll just soon go to dallas this three times a week walmart. i've got a good peritoneal dialysis story so in residency lady come in and of course you worry about infection right i mean she looks sick got a fever tender all over her belly and she's peritoneal dialysis and she has a tube hanging out and she has a bag of her stuff because like i said they're just constantly so she's infusing or removing fluid and in there talking to her and her husband or the person with them i said why why, why is there tape on the tube going to her belly oh that's where the cat chewed it and it was leaking <laughs> well we know why you have an infection <laughs> so <laughs> And she probably just went to Walmart too. <laughs> so, some of the disadvantage, one of the biggest things is infection. We talked about that. Um, the, this, this type of dialysis, the peritoneal dialysis, doesn't always remove all the toxins quite like the hemodialysis does. So it's not as effective. Uh, there can be some discomfort. I mean, they're putting a liter of fluid in your gut and letting it come back out. So that can come, cause some discomfort. This can go up to, once again, four times a day. They may have to do this infusion. Uh, but they're in the privacy of their home home the whole time they're doing it if they so wish uh, but it limits your activities you know once again you don't want to get in a public swimming pool although uh, there are some devices out now that seal that off where you can still swim 
Uh, but once again, you're, you're sure increasing that chance of, uh, of infection. So post dialysis concerns, some of the things we start talking about, we worry about in the field, uh, is first of all, hyperkalemia. So high potassium levels. This is not a normal problem. Normally their potassium stays fairly normal because they're in dialysis on a regular basis. But if they happen to miss their appointment one time, this can become a problem. <clears throat> so we start talking about kind of what causes, because everybody knows, well, I'm looking for peak T waves. But some of the things we don't realize is peak T waves with P waves present, we're looking at about five and a half to six and a half. Not exactly a lethal, deadly uh, high potassium. It is definitely elevated and it can cause us some problems, but it's, it's getting there. Now, I moved to six and a half to roughly seven and a half. I now lose my P wave, but I still got peak T's. This is becoming a little bit more lethal for me. And then seven to eight and eight to 10, I'll get a YQRS complex, a sine wave, or, or ventricular arrhythmias asystole. So that's definitely where we're gonna see sort of causing more problems. You know, so if they say, hey, I haven't been to dialysis in, you know, a week, and dad's in arrest, he's showing, you know, V-fib on the monitor, this is where we start moving with our calcium uh, chloride a lot faster. Um, we also have to start thinking about hyponutremia, hypocalcemia, hypermagnesium, um, and so this is where, you know, we start worrying about the, you know, the altered mental status, the confusion, weakness, nausea. Well, that's our everyday general dialysis patient. So this could always constantly be a problem for us. We see that a lot with those folks. Chest pain. This occurs very common at, at the dialysis center. We have a lot of chest pain calls. The ones that aren't in arrest, they've got chest pain, typically. That's a good, or, they're all, or they're unconscious. You got to think about what's going on here. Now, how much did we, you know, we said 25% of the blood flow could be in the kidneys at one time. But as they're pulling it off, they're pulling it off by kilos. And so that's something we need to ask is how many kilos did you take off? In stage uh, renal patients have a high prevalence of coronary artery disease. So can they have an MI during it? Yes. Remember, I'm pulling more blood volume off. I have less coronary and cerebral perfusion. Well, that answers my question for why are they unconscious and why are they having chest pain? They may not have the coronary <coughs> perfusion in order to get there, but they also may have the coronary artery disease. They also have a higher risk for a myocardial infarct, once again, uh, and if they do, we do see that, we're going to treat it as normal. Oxygen, aspirin, nitro, and fentanyl. And remember, probably 80% have hypertension diabetes. That increases your chance yeah. for coronary artery disease. And it makes there, there's some difficulty then in the emergency department because, you know, of course we look at EKG and then what blood work do we like to look at for chest pain? Troponin. Troponin. So everybody has a little bit of troponin that comes out, but it's really not detectable in you and me. But when you're a kidney patient, you're going to have some elevated troponin just normally. So then you get an elevated troponin. Well, is that a non-ST elevation MI or is it just because they're a dialysis patient? So it just becomes difficult. So that's something in a clinic, you know, if you had a dialysis patient just left dialysis, they go to the clinic and they hand you the paperwork and you're looking at a component of 0.8. And I can tell you, I mean, yep. here or any tertiary care center, you will get so many transfers from the outlying rural hospitals for an end STEMI because they're a dialysis patient and they have a 0.8 troponin. Could it's, be normal. And a lot of it, then you trend it, you know, okay, it was 0.8 now, what is it now, you know, later and tomorrow? It's still 0.8, well, it's not elevated. If it's truly an end STEMI, it'll go up quick. So they may live with that. Yeah. Uh, then we start talking about the hypotension. So this is where we start talking about, once again, they're taking off kilos of weight. This is where uh, we start talking about, this gives us the reason of why they may have chest pain or the reason why they may be unconscious is because they pulled off a little too much. It is okay to give these folks some fluid, but we do want to keep it limited to two to 250 of NS uh, if we suspect that they are a little dry at that point. One of the best ways is to use the subclavian area and check the skin turgor there. Just give it a little bit of a pinch, not a hard pinch, just a light pinch, and see if that skin stands up, or, and that's going to tell us a lot about skin turgor around the subclavian area. So let's look at a couple of reports. <clears throat> First of all, I went to an arrest there. Um, the wife says... Uh, uh, <clears throat> that he was in the car, uh, she got back in the car and noticed that he was slumped over and unresponsive. 
Uh, the first assessment uh, confirms there was no pulses. They quickly uh, extricated the patient uh, to a backboard, started CPR, uh, started once again, initial set of vital signs were zero and zero. Uh, they started with the, uh, the passive airway, CPR once again, good documentation there about rotating your first responders. Uh, they did a uh, nasal oral airway, passive airway, uh, oxygen cardiac monitor, and an IV was established uh, with one attempt and the first dose of epinephrine was given with no change in the cardiac rhythm. You've got to really worry about this right now because did they miss before? Is this their normal? Remember, hyperkalemia is not normally a problem for your renal patients because they're in dialysis regularly. They're getting this taken care of. Uh, they did the dextrose, uh, Narcan, another epi, uh, calcium chloride. They thought about that very quickly, got that on board because they could be worried about that, about the hyperkalemia. They got a nice big ET tube in, 8.5, secured the airway. Uh, they even got a gastric tube in. You know, they, they had some problems with, with uh, a little bit of distension in the belly, so they went and dropped a gastric tube, and then they came in with their bicarbonate. Now, these patients historically can live a little acidotic. That's where they live. So every cardiac arrest needs to be a little acidotic because that's where the body's going to do a little bit better during arrest. But we don't want it too acidotic at that point. So they went ahead and followed up with the bicarb. <clears throat> the uh, epi, then they got Ross back with strong radial pulses um, at 1017. So just a little bit into the code. Uh, got some dopamine on board. Uh, even with strong radial pulses, I'm going to show you why. They did a little fentanyl for pain management uh, post uh, intubation and sedation. But you can see they had strong radial pulses, but pressure was still 72 over 52. On a map, are they perfusing their coronaries? They're, they're right there. They're teetering with it. I mean, you're going to perfuse at that point, but we want to make sure that we're giving them every opportunity so we may need to increase that pressure. Remember that most of these renal patients live at a high blood pressure anyway. So they may need a little bit more to perfuse their coronary artery disease or their brain or and <coughs> remember their body's still dumping, trying to function uh, at, with that. CPR analysis looked pretty good. They stayed right, uh, did fairly well. Uh, they had a couple of little spikes a little higher. And remember our gold standard here is what we're looking at is 60 per AHA now. We want the to total target, that's CCF. That's the rate of co proper compressions with proper depth for the whole code, and they were about 57%. The AHA gold standard is 60. So they were close there, um, but once again, we see this a lot, rate, 94% in target, but here's what gets you right there is the depth, not always uh, total compliant. Um, Sorry. Yes, go ahead. I'm in two CPR plugs now, didn't, didn't ring very well. Two different packages. Big patients or little patients? I have one little small patient and then one with greater size. Hmm. And I wrote, I mean, of course, I don't know. I wrote in my report that CPR puck yeah. that was not accurate. Do, Cause I don't know. Did we send that that off? Does it go for report the whole time? Could you want that in that report versus I don't know. If that, oh, well, well you in the next report, report you're going to see they documented uh, a tended chest, or a round chest, or something. Yeah, I think if you're not getting good data with the yeah. puck, you should write. Yeah, definitely cover yourself with that. Yeah. So, and that'll help, you know, justify what, but make sure to let Big Al know so he knows that. Those only two out of all the ones that send all your concerns and complaints to, I mean, uh, anything to Al. Thank you. Take care of you. <laughs> well, actually, you should, and then we can check into the monitor and see if, you know, yeah. that equipment needs to be changed yeah. out. And then they may look at the lot number, may have a whole lot of those that are bad. Yeah. We did that, we that yeah, one Yeah, we've seen those off before so. and stuff. <clears throat> Yeah. You see, good good point. Um, so as we got to the hospital, um, once again, uh, the patient had some involuntary uh, jerking over the next little bit, uh, very poor diagnosis long-term, EEG uh, was uh, not reassuring uh, of the patient. But as you can see, their H and H, once again, remember that these patients a lot of time are generally anemic. And this one was, he had a positive D-dimer, which can be an indication for a clot, but he's a renal patient. So that kind of throws that out. Glucose was a little high. Uh, BUN, this is where, I'm sorry, uh, BNP, this is where they start to look at renal and um, mainly uh, congestive failure, how aggressive his congestive failure is. 
Well, he's a renal patient, he's retaining fluid anyway, so it's gonna give him a high, naturally high BNP. Well, that number by itself that tells me right. nothing. What I need to know, what was the last clinic visit? Was right. he 80,000 then, or was he 700? Yeah. yeah. And so normal on that should be 124, but then his pH is 7.1. Well, remember they lived a little bit, and then his lactate's elevated to 5.9. So <clears throat> once again, he lived for about three days. He coded twice, uh, once during dialysis, went into PAA, P <laughs> PEA, and then uh, passed away on day three. I'll just talk after the next one. Okay. So the report of the month, uh, Mr. Kraft. Okay, I had to think about it. He's not here tonight, is he? I have a gift card for him. If he doesn't want it, we'll go eat. But anyway. Uh, so cardiac arrest at the dialysis center. Patient weighed about, uh, was in his 70s, weighed about uh, 130 kilos. So fairly large gentleman. Uh, nursing staff uh, at the dialysis center uh, was almost halfway through. Okay, so right there, should already, I should be keying off. What's my potassium? It could be high it could be elevated a little bit. So I've got to think about that. Plus I'm going to have hyponatremia. I mean, I could have a lot of different factors going on right now. Uh, and so he went unresponsive. They disconnected me from the machine and uh, called 911 and we hurried over. So we get there, they started CPR once again. Here's where they documented it. Due to the large size of the patient's chest, it was difficult to obtain the 2.4 inches. LFR crew was coached. Uh, and so that's good. That's great documentation there to tell us why we're seeing the numbers we're seeing. Uh, patient was found once again immediately inside the entrance uh, of the facility, chest compression's going. Cardiac monitor is placed, uh, nice comments everywhere, exactly, you know, passive airway, we understand what, but how did you do it? Uh, great spot for that. <clears throat> uh, an IO was established, uh, epinephrine with epi was given, suction, Calcium chloride quickly. We're only halfway through. They were worried about possibly having some hyperkalemia. So they wanted to get that on board. Uh, have the epinephrine on once again. They intubated him. Went ahead and used a bougie. Uh, due to the large amount of blood in the lungs and the airway, numerous times this entitled CO2 was changed out. Good documentation of that to help uh, cover of why those numbers aren't. They got an oxygen with a peep valve in place to add that natural peep that the body needs of about five centimeters of water. Once again, they suctioned a total of about 600 of red throffy uh, from the ET tube. Once again, epi given. Sodium bicarbonate, they got dopamine hanging early, uh, epinephrine, and uh, they got return of spontaneous circulation was achieved. Uh, so they got that, the patient was known to be bradycardic at that point. Uh, so they tried some pacing. Uh, they did not get capture at 90 milliamps, they finally got capture at 140 milliamps, blood pressure of 76 palpated. Uh, dopamine was used uh, with external pacing at that point uh, to, try to, to try to stimulate some of that and squeeze, squeeze everything where we needed to. Unfortunately, uh, the hospital uh, staff removed EMS pacing pads before they replaced their own, so uh, that was documented there. Um, and we do not know the hospital outcome because the patient was taken somewhere other than UMC. As you can see, their CPR very pretty well consistent. Remember the last one we had a couple of pretty good little spikes. We got a nice, uh, nice even uh, on the rate depth, and you can see they were at 69.7 percent total CCF. So very, very good. Uh, great numbers there and there. So uh, everything looked really nice with this report. They did a great job. Yeah, I agree. I mean, these are two cases we run all the time, right? Run codes. So what are the two most important things that matter in CPR in a code that make a difference? Quality chest compressions, right? And early defibrillation. Those are the only two things scientifically that increase outcomes and not only get ROS, but send home grandma and grandpas. So passive oxygenation, how long do we do that for? So if you do that for eight minutes, is that a problem? Or for three minutes? So just, I hear occasionally, I don't know if it happens, that I hear that people are very much kind of, okay, wait, it's not been six minutes yet. Remember, that's not the intent of the six minutes. That six minutes is a suggestion. That's to give time to get, kind of get in that routine, right? You know, because we don't want to show up and focus on the airway. So 
if it takes you 14 minutes or if it's a you know you show up and fire says well, we've been doing passive oxygenation for five minutes you get down there move to the airway we already got about six minutes so remember that is not a hard fast you have to do six minutes all right um something else on the asystole we talk about the throw in the kitchen sink i wish we had a picture of that protocol but what i want to talk about there is the dopamine because that's listed as an asystole right how many of y'all use that very often as far as just asystolic you work in the code and you just start dopamine i'm gonna raise your hands how often <coughs> kind of occasionally we've had some people i don't know to say question it but Where's the science there? There's really not a whole lot of science behind that. Um, but what does dopamine do? It helps with squeeze. It theoretically might help the patient. So an asystolic patient, what's their chance of survival? It's already pretty low, right? What are we gonna do after 20, 25 minutes? Terminate efforts, most likely. So we're gonna look at it closer at the protocol committee. I'm not convinced it needs to go away. I'm not convinced it really makes a difference. One other thing that some other services are starting to do is just doing an epi infusion from right at the start instead of just doing push epi every two minutes, right? So you just start an epi infusion on all codes and continue the infusion. So it may be something we look at as well. So any questions? I found the kidney is really fascinating. And I think dialysis is fascinating whenever you think about what that machine can do and how we can, I mean, we've prolonged if you think about how many people's on dialysis, we've prolonged probably millions of years of human life with dialysis, for better or worse. Hopefully for better.